On this recent 4th of July, there was an amusing thing that happened in the media. Uh, it is a long-standing tradition on National Public Radio on the 4th of July to have their various uh, radio voices come on the air and read the Declaration of Independence bit by bit, start to finish. Well, NPR decided this year that they would do that, but they would also tweet the Declaration of Independence. And for those of you who are familiar with Twitter, uh, an individual tweet can't be more than 140 characters. So you can imagine it would take quite a lot of tweets to get through the whole Declaration of Independence. And so they did. 140 characters at a time, they tweeted the Declaration of Independence. Well, uh, it, it showed up in people's Twitter feeds bit by bit. Uh, but not everyone connected it to the larger whole of the Declaration of Independence, only seeing perhaps one line, and as people are wont to do on social media platforms, they shared their opinions, not realizing that NPR was tweeting the Declaration of Independence. So here's an example. One of the lines from the Declaration is this, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Someone commented, Please stop. This is not the right place. Another one, a uh, line from the Declaration, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Someone commented, so NPR is calling for revolution? Interesting way to condone the violence while trying to sound patriotic. Your implications are clear. Uh, we are a nation born of an act of treason depending on the perspective, and yet even for us, even as this founding document is, is being shared on our Independence Day, the notion of treason makes us profoundly uncomfortable. And this lies at the heart of the story of Rahab, who for the people of Jericho was a traitor, and for the people of Israel, she was a hero. So let's hear the rest of this story, continuing where we left off from the second chapter of Joshua. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that dread of you has fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal, deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, as your word comes to us this morning in the example of your servant, Rahab, may we find the marks of faithfulness, so that we might follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to recap the story, the context in which this is taking place, we uh, a couple weeks ago talked about Ruth, and Ruth was a little bit further on down the line in Israel's story. We're backing up to even before the time of the judges. This is in the book, the very beginning of Joshua. Uh, the people are at the door of the promised land. They are ready to cross over, ready finally, after years of wandering in the wilderness, ready to enter the promised land. But wisely, Joshua decides to send ahead spies. They cross the Jordan River, they go into the land, and they come to the city of Jericho. And we know uh, the story of the fall of Jericho. So these spies come in to Jericho, and they find their way to the home of Rahab the prostitute. She lets them in. She gives them shelter. And when word gets to the king that spies are staying with Rahab, of course the king comes or his, his people come and they ask her to give up the spies. She plays ignorant. And then she describes to these spies how Jericho is feeling about the coming of Israel. They're all trembling in fear and Rahab 
knows that their God is the God of heaven and earth. So she strikes a deal with these spies that if they preserve her life and the life of her family, when Jericho is destroyed, that she will not say a word about their presence or their visit. So as we know, the story unfolds. Joshua and the, and the army of Israel march around Jericho several times. They blow their trumpets, they shout, and the walls come and tumble and down, and that is the end of Jericho. But before that happens, Rahab and her family are indeed spared. The text tells us that Rahab lived out the rest of her life in Israel, essentially becoming an Israelite. And so it may sound to you rightly that Ruth and Naomi, ha- or Ruth and Naomi, Ruth and Rahab have quite a lot in common. The contours of their story are very much the same. They are both uh, outsiders to Israel. Neither of them is born an Israelite, yet they act with tremendous courage, ultimately becoming embraced by God's people. And, incidentally, both becoming a part of the genealogy of Jesus. Rahab will give birth to Boaz. You'll remember Boaz from the story of Ruth. Boaz, the man that Ruth marries after her first husband dies. They give birth to Obed, the father of Jesse, father of David, and so on and so forth. Rahab and Ruth have a lot in common. But the text is clear, and it goes to great lengths to remind us as we enter into Rahab's story that she is a prostitute. So we don't have what we had with Ruth, a certain sense of uh, moral high ground for Ruth. Ruth is immediately an appealing character, a heroine, someone whose courage we can immediately admire. Not so for Rahab, the prostitute. Rahab, from the outset, is morally suspect. Now I want to take a brief aside here to highlight something that we will likely come back to as we talk about the women of Scripture. In one sense or another, all the women of the Bible are morally suspect. And that is not any fault of theirs. It is the fault of being a woman in the ancient world. Listen to these words from the text. Speaking of the spies. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and spent the night there. Now tell me whose morals should be under the microscope. Those of Rahab or those of the men who decided that a prostitute's home would be a good place to spend the night. This is just something that we need to be aware of. Generally speaking, men in Scripture are innocent until proven guilty, and women are guilty until proven innocent. An argument has to be made in favor of supporting their moral uprightness, lest we doubt them. Men get the benefit of the doubt. And along those lines, Uh, It's not necessarily clear, at least according to a couple of commentators, that she was indeed a prostitute. It's quite possible that she was an innkeeper or some sort of self-sufficient, independent woman. A person that perhaps in the ancient world there simply wasn't a word for. Nevertheless, she comes to us as a morally suspect prostitute. But there is more to Rahab than her profession more to her than what she has chosen to do to make a living or to survive. In fact, this text, it gives us a story of her transformation. And I want to trace the path of that transformation. And it begins when Rahab recognizes the work of God. She says, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. The story of Israel has spread into the promised land before the Israelites have even made it there, striking fear and dread into the hearts of those in the city of Jericho at least and perhaps in other places. But fear does not seem to be the reaction that Rahab has. Rahab seems to be reacting more with a sense of wonder and awe. There's something different that she sees happening in the people of Israel. This is not, for her, politics as usual. One nation state coming into conflict with another nation state. May the greater army win. For Rahab, there's something bigger going on here. It suggests to me that she's been waiting. She's been looking. She's been wondering if there's something more for her, more than this life that she's chosen or that has been chosen for her. We do not know. 
that there maybe is more of a purpose for her that extends beyond what she can see. She is watching for something bigger than politics as usual, something more than the world, the reality that she exists within. And so when she sees the people of Israel coming, she doesn't see a threatening force. She sees the hand of God at work. And that's where it begins. It begins when she sees the hand of God at work. And then she acknowledges this God. She uses the name of God, Yahweh, which we gloss over in the Old Testament as the Lord. She says, Yahweh, your God, is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. One of the takeaways from our look at Ruth's story was that her conviction that there is room in the family of God even for her. We see the same thing happening here in Rahab's own heart. This sense that this invading people is not a threat, but instead is bringing with them a God who has made room for people such as her, for a woman, a self-sufficient woman, or even a prostitute. Rahab trusts that there is room even for her, that Yahweh, the Lord, is the God in heaven above and on earth. God's family is not a club for the righteousness. God's family is an embrace of the willing, an embrace of the hurting, an embrace of the outcasts. Rahab sees, as Ruth did, what many Israelites do not. Yahweh is God even of Jericho, God even of Rahab. And so the third step to her transformation is that her loyalties are realigned. Here's where we enter into the domain of treason. She says to the spies, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you will turn, you will, you in turn will deal kindly with my family. She has witnessed God at work, seen the hand of God moving in the world around her, and now it has entered into her home, into her own life. She is no longer a citizen of Jericho. She is now a daughter of of Abraham. She is no longer a prostitute or whatever she might have been. She is now a child of God. And so it looks to the, the uh, residents of Jericho to be a betrayal is for her faithfulness to the purposes of God. And her transformation is complete. Whether or not she is liberated from this city, whether or not the spies uphold their end of the bargain. She has seen the work of God coming from afar. She has welcomed it into her life and she has allowed it to realign her loyalties. Our own transformation follows the same course. It begins when we recognize God at work in the world. God at work in us. For some of us, that's a long, slow process of realization, God slowly chipping away at us. For others of us, it's a slap in the face or a kick in the pants. It's a recognition that God is here and God cannot be denied. But our transformation begins when we recognize that God is indeed at work around us and in us. That there are things happening in this world and in our lives. And I don't mean supernatural happenings. I mean the most mundane things that we see going on around us, recognizing that God is present even there, even in the most mundane, casual interactions, the things that we witness day in and day out, God is there and God is here. And that is where our transformation begins. And it continues as we recognize, as Rahab did, that this God, this God who is chiseling away at us, this God who is, who is working around us and entering into our lives is the God of all. Not just the God of Israel, but also the God of Jericho. Not just the God of Joshua and the morally upright heroes of Israel, but also the God of Rahab, the prostitute. The more we see this God at work, the more we come to know who this God is and how this God works. That this God has embraced me, that this God has embraced each and every one of us. That doesn't just mean that we are the good ones. It means that God is good. 
It means that this is the sword of God that we see at work in the world. This is the sword of God that has come to work in our lives to change us and transform us. And that transformation is complete. When our loyalties are realigned, which brings us back to Rahab's treason, her act of betrayal. Now we sometimes assume that faithfulness to God, though challenging, has certain limits. There are limits to our faithfulness. Our faithfulness is exercised within certain constraints. There are fences around our acts of faithfulness. There are certain things that simply must not be challenged, certain ideas that must not be entertained, certain allegiances that must not be forsaken. Now for Rahab, one of these sacred allegiances would surely have been to her people, to her city, to her nation, and to whatever God it was that they worshipped. If she didn't have that, she had nothing. It was her home, it was her protection, it was her livelihood, yet she was willing to forsake even that, that most essential, fundamental allegiance. In the 1930s, this is before World War I and still in the aftermath of World War II, in Germany there was a resurgent German movement under one Adolf Hitler. And it began uh, quite naturally and normally, surely, as a sense of national pride, uh, a resurging national strength. And over time, the Christian churches in Germany decided, maybe it wasn't a conscious decision, but essentially they decided to allow this to run its course. That their allegiance as Germans allowed for this to happen. That it was acceptable, even laudable, for Germany to become great the way that it once was though it had struggled so much after World War I. And so the Christian churches of Germany allowed Hitler to come to power, allowed him to gain power, and allowed that momentum to build. Meanwhile, there were those in the German church who disagreed. There were those in the German Christian church who felt that allegiance to the German government was coming into conflict with their allegiance to the Word of God, to Christ. This group, this small group of Germans came to call themselves the Confessing Church. And they wrote a document, a document that they circulated throughout all the Christian churches in Germany called the Theological Declaration of Barman, a document that is today in our book of confessions as Presbyterians. And it calls into, uh, um, it, it points out, I should say, where the Christians in Germany had failed to recognize their true allegiances. Here's an example of what it says. As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness he, is He also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through Him befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to His creatures. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords. Areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through Him. The point that they are making is that the nature of their allegiance as Christians is that it belongs wholly to one Lord and not certain aspects of our life belonging to different lords. This was what they observed happening in Germany. And the question of our loyalties can go even further, even deeper for us as Christians. The medieval Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, once prayed the very short and memorable prayer, I pray God, rid me of God. I pray God, rid me of God. We have an ability, a unique ability as humans, to turn almost anything into an idol, almost anything into an object of devotion. And what this prayer from this mystic from centuries ago suggests is that even God can become for us 
an object of false devotion. Even this, this, our ideas of God, our beliefs about God, our human notions about God, even those things can become an allegiance which needs to be questioned. There's a story uh, told, I'm guessing written by the author James uh, Rollins, Pete Rollins, sorry, um, a fable of sorts. He tells a story of a preacher, a preacher who had a powerful gift. And this gift, if you would call it that, was that whenever he prayed for someone, they would lose their faith. Whenever he prayed for a person, they would lose all their religious convictions. And so you might imagine he did not pray for very many people. Uh, though he was a preacher, he kept to preaching and left the praying to others. Uh, one day he was traveling and he was next to a, a, a businessman on an airplane and this businessman saw him reading the Bible. And so this very successful, very obviously wealthy businessman began to share with this preacher about his own faith because he saw him holding a Bible. This businessman had a very strong, uh, deep faith. Spent a lot of time in prayer and reading scripture and acknowledged, confessed to the preacher the challenges of being a businessman. It's a, it's a cold, hard world. And for this businessman, his faith is what kept him grounded. He says that in my line of work, there are situations in which I find myself that challenge my Christian convictions. But when confronted by such situations, I try as much as possible to remain true to my faith. Indeed, it is my faith that stops me from getting too caught up in that heartless world of work, reminding me that I am really a man of God. At this, the preacher decided to say a prayer for this man, offered to pray, and he, of course, accepted, said a brief prayer, after which the businessman said, what a fool I have been for all these years there's no God above who's looking out for me. There are no sacred texts to guide me. There is no spirit to inspire me. This being a fable, years later, the preacher met the same businessman by happenstance. And the preacher learned that what this businessman had done, suddenly feeling like he had no religious beliefs to make him question his work and to hold it lightly, that he was no longer able to continue with that work. He was faced with the fact that he was now just a hard-nosed businessman working in a corrupt system and began to despise himself. And so shortly after his meeting with the preacher, he had given up his line of work completely. He gave the money he had accumulated to the poor, and he started to use his considerable expertise to help a local charity. Confronted by the preacher again that many years later, he said, thank you for helping me to discover my faith. Like Rahab, as God transforms us, our loyalties are realigned. There is almost nothing that cannot be realigned, reoriented as God works in our lives, even our religion is sometimes worthy of a healthy dose of treason and betrayal. Our most fundamental loyalties get realigned when we experience the work of God. Our loyalties to family, to party, to nation, even religion, they all become subservient to the, our loyalty to God. To the God who is above in heaven and here on earth, the God who is the God of Israel and Jericho, the God of the heroes and the prostitutes, the one who is the God of all. Rahab was a traitor to her own people, but she was a hero She was uh, to the people of Israel. She was a part of the purposes of God. To follow Christ is to seek the faithfulness of Rahab. A faithfulness that is willing to cross any boundary, to challenge any idea, to take any action in order to be a living testimony to the love of this God. This God who is made known to us in the love of Jesus. Let us pray. God, we desire to be your faithful people. We desire to show forth your love to this hurting world. 
And so we ask that you would tear down anything that might stand in our way of that solitary goal. In Jesus' name we pray.